Hi there, good evening. Welcome to State of Affairs here on G Twan Television. I am Francis Abbott. It's another Monday evening, and of course, when there are matters of national concern, we find the right guests to bring the right perspectives to the matters that need to be discussed and thoroughly analyzed here on the show. Welcome once again. The show is brought to you with a kind of association with MTN. MTN is everywhere you go. And MTN says to let you know that they have a brand new app out that has to help you in your transactions, kind care see mobile money. It's called MTN Momo. We can find it on the Google Play Store or the App Store. You cannot miss it. It has the blue and yellow icon. Once you download it and you enter your details, you're able to transact all business you can view your statements you can send or receive money everything you will do on mobile money it's possible pay your bills everything is possible when you download and use the app mtn Momo. mtn is everywhere you go our guest tonight is a man who's well known the last time i spoke to him we had a big laugh about how he's graying and much of his perspective that he's bringing to much of national concern now he's inching closer to the age 80 he's in his 70s but his brain is still as fresh and his tongue is still as blunt as you could ever imagine. Professor Stephen Adair is our guest tonight on State of Affairs. Prof, thank you for joining us. You are welcome. I trust you're well and keeping safe. So far, so good. So far, so good. <laughs> what has been keeping you busy recently? Well, first of all, my, for some time now, my wife has not been too well. So okay. I spend a lot of time with her at home. Okay. So, yeah. so you are the nurse now? Taking care I'm of not a wife. nurse, but I'm the main caregiver. Main caregiver. Great. I also spend a lot of time about Ghana Christian International High School. Yes. I'm doing about three major volumes of work writing. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite busy and I still serve on several boards, not state boards, but mm -hmm. private sector boards. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it keeps me busy. In fact, I'm working as much as I was working when I was 50. Oh, wow. Yes, as much. Just as much? As much. And that keeps you going? Very much so. The only difference is that I work from home okay. most of the time. So now there's not so much driving in and out no, of town. No, I'm not. You're home now. Yes. Doing a lot of the work from home, yes. calls, Zoom meetings, yes. and all that. At 90%, thanks COVID. Okay. All the 90% of the boards, we do it sitting in my board, uh, my hall mm -hmm. at home. On Zoom meetings. Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. So Interesting. It, it's quite. And these are private boards, correct? Yes. Good. I mean, chair, uh, chairman of M Fan, mm -hmm. chairman of B Fan, uh, member of Adansi Rural Bank, mm -hmm. chairman of Accra College of Medicine uh, Council, chairman of Ghana Christian. Mm -hmm. no, there's so many of them. And. Uh, almost ab about 10 of them that, you, that, that you've had to yeah. offer your services for yeah service because uh, when you get older when you serve on board you are praising your I mean, experience at the disposal of younger and much more sometimes more brilliant executives but at least you can say that you know we've been here before and that things. so it's a it's a fun actually seven on balls to me it's Fantastic. my contribution especially to the generation just after you <laughs> so they do better yeah than what you have yeah you tell them your experiences and sometimes you know something may be obvious which you struggle through mm -hmm. but you tell them they think that you are a genius they don't know that <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Speaking of boards, yes. Um, I know up until recently you were on the board of the Ghana Revenue Authority. Yes. yes. I was chairman of GRA yes. and you chairman of NDPC. Of NDPC. Um, why did you have to leave those boards? Well, you serve at the at the pleasure of the president. Yes. So I was at home one day and I saw that a new board has been put in place in GRA. So that's how. But typically, when when, <laughs> when 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 a board is serving, um, when when the president decides to say thank you for your contribution and then create a new board, you are giving notice, isn't it? Or, or no, nothing no. like that happened. Normally, you would be. I think that is quite unfortunate that every now and then the politicians, even without being serving notice, there was a change of government. I mean, change not of one regime to the other, but now the they, second term. Yeah, they take it as second term, automatically you are out unless they say otherwise so that's not not a word to you <laughs> so just one player so on the GRA board you were chair yeah up until 2020 
20, no, no, I was uh, until, yeah, 2020, January 2020. January 2021. Yes. That's when you, yes. you, were, you were moved. A new board, was new board was created. Constituted. Okay. Now, in your time in seven on the board, is it your understanding? And, and for me, this, 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 this is quite bizarre. You've been in corporate governance structure for, for quite a long time. Are you surprised that no communication was put out to you that, okay, time done, thank you for your service, we are creating a new board? Or well, you think that some people were uncomfortable with how you were leading? Basically, it's the most disrespectful way of saying goodbye to any board. Mm. <laughs> but then uh, we are in Ghana. so. But, yes. when, but when that happened, did you make any calls? Did you ask no, why? No, no. Didn't call because, the president, didn't call the finance minister, no, nobody? No, because for me, it's an opportunity to serve. You know, unfortunately, people, when they become in our system, board chair, they have inordinate advantages or they do things and therefore but for me thank god apart from my board fees mm -hmm. which cost it cost me more to serve as a board chairman of gra which is a very important national institution mm -hmm. than the four thousand when we sit and there's no other allowance apart from sitting allowance so if you say that at a certain point for reasons best known to you i shouldn't continue Personally, it makes no difference, but I think that uh, it would have been better for things to be otherwise. But this is Ghana, the politicians do what they like. Okay. <laughs> but, but this same politician appointed you, and when he was doing it, he called you, asked you to serve on the board. You yes, said yes. Yes, I was approached, in fact, in my home. Mm -hmm. By the president? Of course, not the president will not come to your home. I mean, <laughs> we haven't reached that level yet. <laughs> well, but a minister comes to my house and asks, Please, will you do so? Finance Minister? These are obvious to you. You, you didn't pass your examination. The I minister, did. The, the I minister, did, but, I, but I, I'm just asking for the yeah, minister. Of course, it will be the Minister for Finance because yes. GRA will be under the Minister of Finance. Mm -hmm. He came to you, yes. asked you to serve. Yes. And when, he was, and when a new board was being created, he didn't come out to tell you that you're no longer needed? I heard it only on the television. Wow. <laughs> but that's for me... I have served governments all my life, from the age of 25. I, I served in the public service, national and international, mm -hmm. until I retired at 60. So there are certain things you get used to. <laughs> so you were used to this? You were surprised, but yes. not surprised? Yes. I see, I see. Um, post your exit from the uh, board of the GRA, a lot of things have happened. Um, we have seen issues being raised about GRE harassing businesses, the Vice President had occasion to mention that uh, targets that have to be met in terms of revenue mobilization as a country. Post your exit, are you seeing the organization do much better flourishing based on the thing that you are taking prior or is taking a decline? Let me say that I think that the Vice President's speech was a bit unfortunate. How so? I don't think that uh, the GRE harasses taxpayers. Yes, uh, the law says that at a certain point, if you accumulate debt, and especially even the public institutions are the worst culprits, they will even get, you know, withholding tax and not paid. It's the responsibility of GRA to enforce the law. So sometimes, but that's not the norm of GRA harassing people. So I wouldn't say that things have went uh, worse because I wasn't there. I think that how many Ghanaians really voluntarily want to pay tax? If I were, I, I will ask you, but don't answer. Mm -hmm. How many times have you filed your tax returns mm -hmm. on time? You should have shouldn't answer, so I would. Yes, so I don't want you to answer. <laughs> so by the 7th of April, or oh, I've forgotten the date, Everybody is supposed to file your tax. If you're a business, you are to have your returns. So in this case, there are so many things that one can say, but I wouldn't say that GRA goes about harassing people. But the vice president spoke within a certain time frame or period when there were concerns being raised about GRA officials pitching camp and uh, you know, tables and chairs at you know, shops checking who's coming yes. in, what they're buying and everything in the, between the reason is this every shop should have a vat receipt mm -hmm. and they don't do so how would the gra 
people find out. Of course, eventually, if you have a, an electronic system and everybody's you you press, it is already in the system and that things. But at this moment, it has to be physical. And you have gone. I have gone to shops, and they have asked me, "Do you want tax a VAT added or not?" This is what they ask you at the shop, and I'm sure you have been asked before. And the GRA has to make sure that people comply with the tax laws. Mm -hmm. If the tax laws are wrong or draconian, it is not GRA that you blame. It is Parliament. It is the government, which are, I mean, the other day, honestly, I saw, even though as a former chairman, as you know, I saw someone importing the car. And there were about 17 small, small taxes on it. Mm -hmm. That actually means that the law must be, and the vice president, I must say that he's, he was said it well, must be looked at and consolidated. And we don't have about 17 tax taxes. When you bring something, this percentage you and have, and before you are, is. 50%. If 50% say that if you bring your team 50%, then there's no room for negotiation. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that has to be done about our tax laws. But GRA has got its own weaknesses, but we shouldn't blame GRA for doing what they are mandated by law to do. And people are not prepared to come. I and you don't comply with it. It's their responsibility. Considering that we are also under an, an, an IMF program, does it make the work of the GRE, especially on revenue mobilization, a lot more tougher? More not tougher because <laughs> their work, whether IMF or no IMF, they should do their job. Mm -hmm. But now that we are not because of IMF regime, we are in such a serious situation that leakages must be plugged and the proportion of GDP to tax to GDP ratio must be upped. That means they must be more efficient. Okay, two quick, two quick points in that corner before we move to other matters. You spoke earlier about the service you, you, you have rendered us on boards, public and private, yeah. now on private boards. On public boards, and you are as blunt as a whistle, are we appointing persons to serve in boards in this country purely based on merit and experience or politics takes precedence over competence looking at cross board not only for yes, what you've done yeah, yeah, yeah. but across board i think it's a combination there's a combination i think that for example i've served on some important boards for example i was a member of the judicial council for six years i think that i was quite impressed with the quality of the people i serve with mm. even gra I could say that at least 80% of the people on it will match with any in terms of quality of that. But for me, the tendency to, for people to see it as, an, as a reward and therefore when someone is serving well, there's a regime change. Anytime you change a board, you have disturbed the system. And if a, a Ghanaian is on the board and he's doing well, a change of regime should not automatically mm. lead their, to their being removed. So that's what. But let me be blunt and say that at least about one third of the people would be political appointees. They are there because they were in the public arena, because of their connection with the party, not because of their competence. But is that not where the problem is? And I, and I ask this also because recently there was talk of patronage by board members and, and their influence on state institutions. Case in point being Ghana Cocoa Board. A memo came out asking that board members be given um, tablet folios, in essence keyboards, for their tablet that they use for their work as board members. Is that what we should be spending money on for board members? Well, you know, sometimes we make mountains out of and hills. Mm. Cocoa Board is a multi-billion organization. Mm -hmm. They do, if they are working like any other boards now, they do a lot of things by Zoom and other things. And I think, and there should be also some protection of the material, and therefore giving a tablet of about 5,000 CDs 
should not even be an issue. This this keyboard, in fact. What is keyboard? What the keyboards that were being procured, so about four thousand five hundred CDs. What what's, what's the it? tablets will be much much more in terms of price. Yeah. Yes. So, if they need it for their job, what I'm saying is so. It's like saying that you know. You, uh, you clean your shoe with a, a shell duster that costs one CD. Mm -hmm. I don't think that if they are doing their job, that should be something we should be sitting here to discuss at all. I serve on the board of Adansi Rural Bank. Mm -hmm. I mean, to see the magnitude, Adansi Rural Bank, we are serving. Each one of them, of us, has been given uh, an iPad coded so that we have our system and every information they send it to us so if Adam zero bank <laughs> can do that can do that why should i sit here and talk about you know cocoa board <laughs> so i mean the it, it is not an issue i think that it's you know the problem sometimes we have because of the widespread corruption and mm -hmm. we can talk about it in the system yeah the ordinary person who is struggling with maybe 10 CDs for watch this morning, mm -hmm. hears that, you know, <laughs> you bought a, a tablet or a keyboard of 5,000 for somebody. Who? But at that level, that is not the issue to be discussed. What is to be discussed is whether they are being efficient, they are keeping an eye on the management, not wasting our billions of money that they have these cocoa bonds not being paid, pensioners, <laughs> you know, dying so-called for not having the services they need with their own money. These are the weightier things, so don't let us digress. Let's go on to another thing. Okay, <laughs> but, but, but still on the principle of the boards and the efficiency, Yeah, are you seeing real value for the investments we put on these boards and how it translates into the health of these companies and how they are being run, especially for state-owned uh, enterprises? The, I can't talk to all because I've served in a few, mm -hmm. but I served on the, as a chairman of NDPC, uh, GRA, member of the Judicial Council, member of the advisory board. I think that this, for me, for what given the abuses and the suspicions because they think that everybody who serves on the state board is a government, is true to the government. I will not, but for the sake of Ghana, serve as GRA's chairman and be given 4,000 only when I sit on the board. All that I do in between even is not rewarded. Mm -hmm. And I think that in fact, in terms of remuneration, the average board member, if they are doing their job, yes, I think uh, they are doing their job. Job are uh, underpaid in Ghana. Underpaid. Very much so. You know, in Britain, normally, if you serve on two or three good boards, that takes care of you. That means you become a full-time director. <laughs> All my ten boards does not meet. Uh, of course, I and. I'm full time employed. Mm -hmm. but all of them together don't meet one fifth. It's about what? One fifth of my <laughs> monthly income. Mm -hmm. So this shows the difference. Because really, if we were not politicizing the appointment mm -hmm. and we were appointing the right people who will then help the organization to do what it is. A, let me not use my, myself as an example, but other boards of mine, because I, that was the executive and they were a board. Mm -hmm. My first board in Gimpa, wow, including Mrs. Sylvia Boy, Boy of West African Examination Council, BK Mensa, the head of the civil service, the head of uh, a, AGI president and the rest. The amount of value that I got from them as a newly appointed head of Director General later on, I think that what I achieved in Gimpa, at least one third should be attributed to them. Mm. And yet how much did they get? They come with half a lunch and they are giving peanut. At that time, I think they weren't even getting 1,000 CDs. <laughs> so if you get a good board, it's a golden. And they bring invaluable uh, uh, service to you. In the same way, if you appoint... A bad one. A, a bad one. It's like a, a two-take. So, if I look at a company and its health... Yes. 
and it's performance and it's yeah. terrible i yes. can point to the board and say they're doing a poor job yes if especially in the private sector but in the public sector sometimes also the board doesn't have all the authority for example the gra head is appointed by the president mm -hmm. And you have to work with him, whether the person is competent or incompetent. So, I don't know, but under normal circumstances, is the board which will recommend somebody to, even if the president is to appoint, it must come from the board. They have interviewed the person, their quality, and everything else. But see what has just happened. Oh, the board, the president has. Uh, dismissed the board, she has dismissed the Commissioner General, she has appointed this one as a Commissioner General. Mm -hmm. For example, when I heard it as a former uh, chairman, I says, What a shame! What a shame! What a shame! Yes, why so? Because the first thing under any civilized system is that you appoint the board, okay, mm -hmm. and then the board will look for competent person who fits the bill maybe you can say get me one or two and then they present it to the but at this moment the person technically is not accountable to the board why because you are appointed by the president and me in the same day <laughs> you, can, you have no right mm -hmm. to fire me and everything else so the board's ability to make sure of the right appointment of the chief executive to hold them accountable and do the policies the systems to shoot is lacking and that is where especially in the public institutions and that's what the problem yes. is again i will use a very small institution because it's far away and doesn't go into politics i don't see rural bank which i happen to be the uh, the most significant shareholder we had a challenge with management and everything else mm -hmm. and the, the board fortunately the bank of ghana we have a totally new board appointed a new chief executive about 90 percent of the managers have been uh, changed an institution which was making laws for about four years mm -hmm. is now this year poised to make about twice all its share capital in profit. Wow. You see the difference. So, <laughs> if you pay them two thousand and they are making a profit for you of ten million, <laughs> nobody will, will, will talk about it. So, it's the mechanisms. I am not only a practitioner of corporate governance, but a teacher in corporate governance. Yes. If we allow the system to work as it ought to be, a good board is invaluable and a colleague of mine a british has written a book the fish rots from the head yes a bad corporate governance situation will always translate into a bad organization and in our case a serious profit make a loss making for the state enterprises that is where the bain is my last two points on this i i've, I've been saying last for a while because the way, <laughs> the, way the conversation goes it always changes but <clears throat> We've had a GRE commissioner yeah. whose contract had ended. Yeah. He, he actually worked without a contract for a while. Yeah. Is that fair and proper? And I'm talking about <laughs> Reverend Ami Shaddai. Yes. You, are, you are an advocate for corporate governance, having the right things yeah. done. Are you surprised that we had someone who was leading our revenue organization as a country who was working without a contract? <laughs> actually, let me just be a bit naughty and say that our laws in Ghana, if somebody is working um, we have praised somebody, he's working and you have agreed for the person to work after six months, he's actually deemed to be properly employed. <laughs> so be very careful when you get people into your organization, you say the cash work, cash work. after six months, the labor law makes the person not just a cash work. that's the first place. The, so that said, I think that for this to have happened, to our greatest institution to me is either mischievous because you then you the person you can ask him to go at any time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because then if he has no contract you can uh, end it at any time or total negligence on the part of somebody who should have seen to it in the in the jubilee house to do so because when i was living he was given a two-year contract 
which was there and when the spider is spread that it will be renewed mm -hmm. so really it was anomalous and it was to me putting this man in an embarrassing situation okay that's when we'll go for our very first break when we're back after the break we'll talk broadly about the Ghanaian economy yes we are under, under an IMF program but the planks on which the economy stands now requires an inquest and he's an economist I would love to take his thoughts on that plus our governance as a country we are in an election year decisions on elections determine the future of countries we'll discuss that after the break stay with us Avoid such a man. Shatawale is called Niyama. Should he be avoided? Shatawale, I didn't know you were saying. She can't not show me joy. Yeah. I didn't want to find me careful. Yeah. Sir. Body do money wole. Hey. Body work any work hello. Yeah, man. Come, my dad's a new way war. Sir. This season of the Natalie Ford Show, get ready to be challenged as we engage our nation's leaders in business, politics and religion. We discuss the hurdles encountered and the innate strength required to take on the challenging yet fulfilling path of leadership. Get prepared to be motivated as you delve deep on the quest to discover your inner genius and learn what it takes and means to be a leader. Shaping the nation's fabric into the Ghana we know and the Ghana we hope to have. On season four of the Natalie Ford Show. The Natalie Ford Show. Conversations that matter. Welcome back. You're watching State of Affairs here on GH1 Television. I am Francis Abbott. My guest tonight, Professor Stephen Adai. Uh, he's a well-known educationist, economist. He is one of the greatest um, national servants, seven on boards, providing services as rector, former rector for GIMPA. Among many other things he's done for the country, you might want to call, call him a statesman and you will not be wrong. Thanks for honoring our invitation to be here with us, sir. So now let's talk about the Ghanaian economy for you. And you, you don't just see it, you feel it, you interact with it, you, you work within it. How would you describe the Ghanaian economy today? Well, it is in intensive care. Intensive care. But the signs for recovery are good, but it's intensive care. Why are we where we are now? 
be honest. I think there are fundamental issues and there are proximity ones. Mm -hmm. You know, Ghanaian economy has Ghanaians rather believe it or not, despite all what we say our papa, the Ghanaian worker is one of the least productive worker in Ga in the world when they are in Ghana. In fact, about was it maybe ten years ago, the Ghana uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences asked me to give a lecture on productivity in Ghana. So I was forced to do some research, and I found that in Africa, Africa, given the same conditions, qualifications, and everything else, the Ghanaian worker was among the least productive worker in Africa. Why is that? Let me just land on this one because important what I mean by that and Togo to me what shocked me when I, in my research was that the Togolese worker was more productive than Ghanaian which I wanted to see evidence of it until I started looking at Togolese workers on construction in Ghana their productivity is far superior to the Ghanaian worker, a mason, electrician, and everything. Yes, uh, tilers and the uh, POP, yes. Pariso. And, and oftentimes, people think that they are Ghanaians. They speak every uh, Latin, but they are not Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. And some of the construction people actually look for them because of their quality work. I think one of the worst legacies of colonialism in Ghana in particular is the Abenjuma mentality. Abenjuma government work. After all these years, yes, that, that's like it's still there. And the private sector people actually sometimes are at the point of weeping in the sense that not only is productivity low, but the people really sabotage, they are almost to be blunt. They are there most of them just to steal to steal to steal and it's becoming norm that even Ghanaians, not only the indians and Latins, now certain positions employ foreigners not the from britain and Latins, from philippines india and other things and put them in certain strategic positions it's one of the sad things that's number one number two our system we had a socialist background from Nkrumah's days and the government played a big role and the private sector which we call the engine of growth has actually been fetched in fact the private sector is seen as a parasite by the average Ghanaian the thing that is so we are almost a hybrid system the ones who should be more productive are seen as parasites though they are there to make money and other things and as a result the conditions under which they work in terms of enabling environment is very 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 restrictive at this moment for example who is going to be productive if and expand their business at an interest rate of 40 percent or 35 percent and i think also that in the past sad to say there has been an unwritten tendency of one regime going after the businesses of the other regime perceived though and really wanting to destroy their businesses has it happened in the last seven years i have not been in the mainstream but i don't think that it is the, it, what was happening will be abolished this time <laughs> it is just a question of is that ndc person or mpp person is still there the the degree i'm not in a position to confirm that is evidence of knee cap oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah yes yes, yes that belong been, to other regions yes it's it, it's been there and so we have therefore successful business per regime and then the cons a few of them and i wouldn't go there and i know why have been able to cross regimes because they know how to play their game mm. from a gym to the other so that is there are some fundamental issues infrastructure in terms of utility prices and everything else but the proximate one which means that this is not MPP regime or energy. It's been there. But the proximate one, I think that 
Then the Kufuado came in with great promises. Mm -hmm. I think that probably in the fourth republic, he raised Ghanaians, the our hope, more than any other president with his programs, with his rhetorics and everything else. And Ghanaians rewarded him for that. He's the only president who won with almost one million <laughs> margin. Vote gap, yes. But either because it went into their head or whatever it is, you know, I myself never realized, but when I sat down as NDPC chair and looking at things, they are so-called priority projects programs, not projects, were 47. When you have 47 programs, with what money? So that's number one. Number two, I... But they borrowed. That's, I'm coming. Number two, they tried to solve an economic development uh, constraints mm -hmm. with a finance solution. They thought that if they had money, they can turn things around overnight. And that led to a very high level of borrowing, mm -hmm. about 11 billion in three years. So immediately, it's like saying that you want your five-year-old to become a graduate in three years. <laughs> no matter how much you spend upon it, you, he may reach P6, but not... <laughs> University, and therefore we overcommitted our capacity to service those loans. Whilst even under normal circumstances, it wouldn't have yielded sufficient to repay it. There's a third. I think they underestimated the ability to control corruption from within or without, wherever. <laughs> because you know, it's interestingly, and. They made great efforts, uh, OSP, this, and all. so that, I must give credit to, but they didn't underestimate their own capacity to be corrupt in terms of the regime. Mm -hmm. But and initially we saw an improvement in the Transparency International Index from 40 to 43. By the way, let me, this is not political, but let me call, correct Sami Genvi, because he was saying that, you know, the lowest, the most corrupt regime was the Kufuadis regime, because in 2017, it hit, in Transparency International, hit 40. Actually, he was, that describes the last year of Mahama, because when what is published today reflects, it's published before March, reflects the year before. Mm. So actually, therefore, the lowest and therefore indicator of the highest level of the rate of corruption was in 2016. So there was an improvement to, to uh, under Kufuado, and, and then it stabilized. You said that 41 for four years running? No, 43. Mm. 43, so 40 to 43. And then it dropped to 41? No, it doesn't drop. This year, it has remained 43. No, the last one is still 43. Anyway, let us uh, I, I, not argue who is correct because the facts will tell us and we don't have the book here to look at. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is this. If you, I know generally some of you might have passed your mathematics just by one mark, but in mathematics we have the second differential, dy, dx and dy to the power 2 over which means the rate of change so what has happened is that while there was a marginal drop in the rate of corruption because they pour so much money into the system the amount quantum of corrupt money will be high so that the leakage will make it impossible for you to service so yes the rate of corruption improved slightly under Akufuado but because they pumped so much money, the leakage will have been higher, and therefore the ability to service will have so been weakened. And that is a very fundamental reason, these three things, is why we will have hit some trouble with or without COVID and Ukraine. Unfortunately, 
before they could say Jack, as we say it in my village, mm -hmm. so that they can re, uh, reposition and try to deal with this, then Ukraine and COVID came and coup de grâce. So it is this became the proximate factors, and then we were overstretched, and without some intervention, the country. Uh, who have been declared bankrupt, except that countries don't declare are not declared bankrupt, but de facto we were bankrupt. Uh, as a result. As a result. Now that we are under the IMF program, there's been a change in leadership for the finance ministry. Was that a, is that a good decision? Well, the change wasn't too dramatic. It was a, a deputy finance minister yeah minister of state yes yeah minister of state so he knows the system and therefore i think that in managing the imf he's better placed to continue so i wouldn't say that the change in terms of managing the economy is dra drastic should the change have been a lot more earlier or the timing was right <laughs> i'm not in a position to but let me say that The one who goes to fresh water is likely to be the one to break the pot. Yes. I think that we had as I say, a very competent and capable Minister of Finance in uh, Kenoforata. I think that his basic mistake was he took a and he's a pure finance man. Investment banker. Yes. He took a finance approach to a development, economic development issues. And of course, it has caught him pants down. I've heard some say that investment bankers are more risk takers than public finance managers. Is that true? Definitely. Could that have accounted for what we have now? Not probably probably but whatever whether it is finance uh, uh, or investment banker mm. this approach to development finance is different and therefore i'm not in a position to talk about the relativity between the two finance mm. angles but basically a development economist should see should always be seeing the lags in investment in an economy it's not like putting it even in a factory or other things that you can talk about it's changing attitudes because for economy to develop you are changing attitudes you are changing the incentive system and you cannot do it in a short time but for me i don't know there are various angles i mean he says i not in quantia akosi has gone but he's at the outskirts mm -hmm. I think that this uh, new finance minister, where Ufuriata has been placed, has also an access to his uh, expertise. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that there has been a big, one of the dramatic changes. Changes that you want to see? No. Last one no, not that I want to see. <clears throat> it is not dramatic because it is the, the, it's within the same family. Same, okay. But as a line for the future, and you mentioned economists, you are an economist. Uh, economist, I am a professor emeritus, okay. and I you say that emeritus and I am re, are close. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> but to the point, should <clears throat> finance ministers be economists, not, development economists? Not, not necessarily, and not in fact, the finance. <laughs> in fact, I study Australia. I did my doctorate in Aust uh, Sydney University. Mm. It was a tradition that Australians don't make an economist a finance minister. Why? Because they think that every economist has got his own biases. Mm -hmm. And therefore you are likely to make your bias the right thing. Whilst they put an intelligent person as the finance minister capable and then intelligence they, from what background and bias? Generally, I mean, for example, I mean, let me just give physical, a real example in Ghana. If you put a person like, say, if you were younger, my uncle would kill me, uh, uh, former MD of Unilever, uh, what, is, what is his name? Unilever? Yeah, Yamsin. Yamsin. For example, Yamsin. Mr. Yamsin wouldn't say that he's a top economist, but hey, he understands business, he understands economics. So you want 
the, this is the type of people when they are con- we put them as the minister of finance i'm using him because if you use a younger person you say you are looking for a job for the person they will understand any economic thing you explain to them but the australians make sure that they have what they call i think the secretary of economics the one who will be the equivalent of our principal secretary and director will be a topmost economist so therefore you have to come and convince the minister mm. and you go to uh, the minister of finance the chief director under uh, the minister uh, what is, we have talking about Kenoforata was just basically any other chief director <laughs> I mean, so the system i think that the system whereby there's a technical economic team but not necessarily the minister being an economist probably works better okay and that's where we'll go for another break after the break we'll talk about governance there's been a recent report out that puts ghana first in terms of democracy in west africa fifth in africa and i think the 15th in the world we'll talk about that after the break stay with us This is where critical minds think, brain beating brains, shoulders rubbing shoulders. Kojo Mapo. A Juanda Kusi Fiada. An Opebia, Luncia, Apa Husima, a Junu Numna, Yatnase, Nundu, Nea Sariso. Nasagana Befan and Juma Pefria. Na if he has a new meal, they are familiar. For <laughs> And one I was I will say from where I was done. You better take that dumb Papa Mario. Serious? Ni pepe ya bebe ya. Ope do giste ya wa. Na pepe munti mi fu. Kwa nani sabi ni na? Ani ya zebra bro mo pocho. Oye diule mo. Na masu mi diule mo. Ne yam kwe yanim. Aha ya bushira ni seven point five. O dem ya wa. Dumb anga 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 anga. Oh I have vision. Can't you see? Meeting you today, we pray for the family. Thank you for the amount of support you've given us. So, it's not just the area we're going to be supporting. No, it's about from Monday to Friday. We are not seeing about from 6:30 to 9 p.m. Guys, I'm not planning to 6:20. And not air with your sports fella. We can also know Sunday 6 pm to 7 pm and also air scoreboard. Mediano, a year breast or semi, free non song copy no do. Yet day, a mile semi, a cosso, a wall, mine gander, a brewer with fear, fear, more calm, and no one potter more. Now, what shall I be in a chair again? I shall say, Ghana, a vineyard into my part. I have with you ninety six point five. Sanko for you may be in our subusu routine. Shame, meme de bia two to five. A family DJ Ricky, a high team penny for him, a high team a man, and a man. A Yamabusia, a Yabusia, Yen and I a Busia, a Busia FM ninety six point five. Your dom. This is Cup of Team. We air Monday to Friday. Uh, from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. Since so, I don't know who said are. Oh, tell me. Yes, the group of people who normally stand around draw draws and they are become like the deputy mates or deputy bus conductors. It will shock you to know how much they make in a day. Wow. Interesting. It's good business. Ciao. My name is Julius Caesar and together with Ivan Hitko from Adobe. 
we come your way always with a cup of tea. Great music, great conversation, giving all the information you are missing on the show. And hey, I am Sarah Briffle, call me SD. I am here with DJ Shata, and together we are here to have fun with you whilst you go about your busy schedule. So, yep, you are at a perfect place at the right time. Join me, let's have fun, have great music you will want to tune and enjoy. Great music, great talk, and ultimate drive. Welcome on board to the city's best drive home. This is the Osprey Drive live here on the Ultimate One Zero Six Point Nine FM. So the name is Mr. Berry back on the radio, and I am doing this as usual with the Lady Gongo, Mr. And this is the Osprey Drive One Zero Six Point Nine Ultimate FM. We are live today on Ultimate One Zero Six Point Nine FM. It's today's relationships. My name is Dacha Hema Papabi. We are on from Tuesdays through to Thursdays from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Welcome everyone. You're live on Ultimate 106.9 FM. It's another Saturday morning and we are here to take you to the fun side of life. I am here as usual with Aquapolo. What have we come to do this morning? We have come and make them colorful. Ah, this is the fun side of life, people. Tune in every Saturday morning. We are on. <laughs> Welcome to Moments of Glory, your number one entertainment lifestyle station. Brings to you this program exactly at 10 a.m. every weekend, as on Saturday till it's 12 noon. My name is NY Juju Green, your gladiator, and I'm about to help you declutter your life and marshal it. We share our tough moments and how we made it through to success. 106.9 FM Ultimate FM Thanks for staying with us. You're watching State of Affairs here on GH1 Television. I am Francis Abbott. Tonight our guest is Professor Stephen Aday, the septuagenarian and also an economist, educationist. He is a, a long-standing public servant, served the country for many, many years, who better to speak to about matters of national concern than him. So thank you once again for being with us. The latest report out suggests that Ghana's good governance is doing quite well. First in West Africa, fifth in Africa, and 48th in the world. You look at the performance as against the ranking, does that bear us out that we're doing well? The answer is yes, and I'm proud of the outcome and the confirmation by an independent body. Mm. You know, we Ghanaians, one of our weaknesses is we specialized in running ourselves down. I mean, for example, when people are talking about the economy, say the, the reckless the Kufuado, you know, this type of, I mean... But, who, has, the, but, but has the borrowing not been reckless? No, it can't, no. Why? The borrowing has not no, been reckless? No, no, that's completely stupid for anyone to say it's reckless. I mean, you think that somebody will be in the Ministry of Finance, the President, and be reckless with the nation? You just no, said I said that... billion dollars in no, borrowing they used, was too much. No, they using finance to no, do reckless, No, reckless is another thing. You know, reckless means, you know... Without no, care. Without care. Without caution. No. Here, it was, I told you that it was a strategy which was not the best because they are trying to solve a standing, difficult development, pro, economic development program with, finance. with a finance. And it's easy for people to make that mistake. But to say reckless, I think that is going overboard. The right adjective would be what? The rate at which you were borrowing. Who said that it was too fast? Too fast. Too fast for what our and exceeded our ability. But that's too certain, fast without caution. No, we, we, what do you mean by caution? Without we, control. No, there was control. I mean, this, it wasn't there. So, but what I'm saying is this: we must be very careful 
For example, I just had to issue a rejoinder. Some people have put my photograph and then said that, you know, I am calling the president as autocratic and then that's another word they use, uh, you know, that if Ghana, we don't see our constitution and another president who is an autocratic, no, no, in Ghana, our system does not allow under our fourth president to be autocratic because there are certain checks and balances. So I think that the fact that I and you can sit here, I have lived in Ghana, I was born in 1948. Mm -hmm. I have lived in Ghana all through its history. That's the day the, 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 the killing of Sergeant Ajiti. And if you have lived in Ghana, even in recent past, on the Rawlings up to 1992, none of us could even discuss a national issue. Today, we have a situation whereby we have a democratic government fortunately we have fortunately or unfortunately because they have pros and cons a hung parliament the president cannot say this is what i want to do and this is done there's the freedom to express our views these are things which have been captured by others it doesn't make this is not the achievement of excuse me to say Daniel Kufuado. it is our collective achievement and we must learn to celebrate it and build on it rather than people saying that you know this is, for example i know there has been a, a cause for concern of some brutalities against a uh, journalist and the rest and these are things we must tackle but nobody in ghana under the fourth republic should not sit down and be proud of what the progress we have made in governance and yet a lot needs to be done okay two questions how would you describe the president's leadership style in in in, in the last seven years going into his eighth year has he been a good leader or, he, or, or he's taking a lot of bad decisions she and again you know you don't take, for example, I had calls to say that during the COVID period, he exhibited, in fact, that's one of the puzzles to me. He exhibited, and I'm a professor of leadership, I have two professorship, professor in economics and leadership. Mm. He exhibited one of the exceptional leaderships. He was carrying the Ghanaians around. Uh, she was telling us where we were going, the difficulties and everything else. And Ghanaians rose to the occasion. I was quite surprised when we had this economic crisis. Almost, he became dumb. <laughs> Couldn't speak. And I was saying that, look, here our city was melting. <laughs> uh, Ghanaians were in such panic, literally. And the president was not addressing the nation. In fact, I had occasion to even send a written comment to the Minister for Finance that the president must address the nation because economic management is not a matter of the books, but the psychology and the reaction of people to the circumstance. So we have a situation whereby uh, there have been times he has demonstrated one of the best leadership qualities and certain times for me he has failed woefully and to me he's a puzzle to be he's a puzzle he's a puzzle still not unraveled no because how the same <laughs> guy in the certain situations you know comes out so tops you can use any leadership indicators and at a certain point he either keeps quiet, shows extreme stubbornness. <laughs> For example, when every Ghanaian says that there has to be some reshuffle, he won't do it. She won't do it. And of course, <laughs> this is a sign of a very stubborn person. <laughs> and leadership requires some stubbornness also. Mm. But at a certain point, you, you don't know whether he has crossed the line. <laughs> Do you think we are handling the power crisis well? That's my last question. 
the power crisis. <clears throat> Let me confess that I haven't experienced the worst part of it much myself personally because I'm I'm on solar. <laughs> oh, so you have evaded it. <laughs> so therefore. Let me say that, and it's amazing why the government is not encouraging solar, because you don't have to, I don't have to go to ECG, and my solar gives me power for about 95% of the time. I think that, again, this is one of the issues whereby coming clear as to really what is happening tends to do better than leaving the room for people to speculate as to whether it is Dumuso or Sodom. Who, sh who should be speaking on this? I think that it is the ECG, VRA and on top of that the Minister for Energy. He spoke and he said we should produce our own timetable. <laughs> Were you surprised by that? Actually, to be honest, I didn't hear that one, but I'm surprised that he says that because how are you going to produce your own timetable when you don't know when? It will come on and go off. So there are certain points in leadership whereby your credibility gets undermined when certain information are not shared. So bold leadership is needed in fixing this problem. Yes. I right. think so. Okay. I think so. I All think. right. That'll be how we end the show today. I thank you very much, Prof, for your time and for joining us. And uh, give me the economic crisis. Yes. Is a start going to solve the old man's economic crisis? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to end. I thank you very much for your time. Before we go, just to remind you, that MTN has a wonderful app that eases your transactions with, with MTN Mobile. It's a brilliant little icon you can't miss. Either in the Google Play Store or the App Store. Download it. Use it for paying or sending money, paying your bills, checking your transaction history. Everything you need, MTN Momo has that answer for you. MTN is everywhere you go. Thanks to the production team for making this show possible. And thanks to you at home for watching. Good night.